Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and in our series on world history here, we are approaching ancient Egypt. We're shortly after the Tower of Babel, so Mizraim has just gone down to Egypt, and we're talking about a certain geographical area, which I will now describe for you. Um, <laughs> When I was a kid and I would look at a map of ancient Egypt and I would see the division between upper and lower Egypt, I was always terribly confused. Can you guess why I was terribly confused? Ooh, ooh, it was upside down. It was upside down because if you're looking at a map with north being up as north should always be, right? (laughs) Upper Egypt is below Lower Egypt um, is actually referring to altitude, um, <laughs> because as we know, water flows downhill from Upper Egypt, which is to the south, through Lower Egypt, which is to the north, and into the Mediterranean Sea. Through the delta. Through the delta, right? Yes. The de- de- rivers have deltas. I thought that was a given, <laughs> but it's it's a no. very large delta. Mm. Uh, it's yes. quite the significant piece of land there. Right. Also, also the interesting thing about the Nile is it flows from the south to the north, but it has two different headwaters, which made for a lot of fun for uh, people exploring back in the 1800s. <laughs> I have found the headwaters. No, I have found the headwater. Oh, wait, Something we like both that. found the headwaters, <laughs> but they're different. Yeah, the, the rumor that there was this huge lake up there somewhere in the middle of darkest Africa may g- got uh, Stanley a lot of uh, laughs at the uh, Royal Geographic Society because he reported what David Livingston had, had told him. And everyone said, that's ridiculous. No river works like that. There's no lake up there. Whatever's in darkest Africa, it couldn't possibly be what you're describing. You are a fake, sir. You never may, met David Livingston. At which point, word came from David Livingston's bearers that he was dead and they'd left his heart behind in Africa, but they brought his body home. And with it, a message saying, give my regards to Mr. Stanley. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> what a tale. <laughs> but yeah, we did not know where the Nile started until 1800 plus years after Christ. So a lot it's, of mystery, a lot to, to explore, and it doesn't get explored for a very, very long time. Well, and it's very interesting when you do start seeing the beginnings of all the exploration, particularly of Egypt. So many things, if we had modern technology, they would have been a cinch. Think of yep. being able to fly over Africa, mm-hmm. uh-huh. <laughs> but, see the big um, lake. <laughs> yeah, but when you're reading the stories of David Livingston and he's, you know, exploring, he literally can't see something because there's a hill in the way, and he can't <laughs> figure out how to get to the top of the hill and see if the, you know, the Nile's on the other side. But he can't get up the hill. Um, and so no it's Google just Earth, let alone Google Maps. <laughs> it's yeah, it's just so fascinating to read their stories and realize how harder it was for them and how much they had to endure, uh, how sick they got, especially mm. exploring Africa. So it's, it's fascinating. So it's the young lady who spent a good deal of time in Africa. N- near where he was, yes. So mm. I can, I can, um, well, I was more to the West, but I can still appreciate being in the heart of tropical equatorial um, Africa and knowing how treacherous it is there where we, <laughs> we claim pretty much everything's trying to kill you. And it's true. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, it was a challenging place to explore. Mm. And we thought Australia was bad. <laughs> anyway. I've never been to Australia. I don't, I don't really have any desire to go to Australia. <laughs> Not many people do once they hear that all the all the creatures that can kill you that aren't in Africa are in Australia. Are in Australia. <laughs> yeah, those two places together pretty much house yeah. all the worst of them. In the in the wake of the flood, the dispersion of Babel, mankind and creatures of various sorts moved and kept moving. And some stopped in Africa because Atlantic and Indian Ocean and, and, and that, and others made it before the, before the water levels rose at the end of the Ice Age, were able to walk or swim or somehow get to Australia just before it get, got cut off. And yeah, and, that's, and so back to Egypt, we're not at the ends of the earth exactly. People were still moving, but a lot of people, including Ham and his family, moved to this place that we call Egypt, which is... <sighs> the naming of countries is a difficult matter. <laughs> it's not just one of your holiday games. 
you may think the Greeks has had as a matter when they didn't care what anybody called themselves. They just put signed whatever name they thought. And so <laughs> out of their own mythology, they came up with the name Egypt. But as Emily already pointed out, they called themselves Mizraim, which means basically the two Egypts. Um, I wonder why. Um, <laughs> there is also... Um, some evidence that the Nile was just, we might, we mentioned the Delta. You, you ask about, doesn't every river have a Delta? Not every river has a Delta, but a lot do. But the thing is this, this Delta looks like a Delta. And it's right, the that's mother. That's why we of, call them Deltas. That's why we call them fact. Deltas. This is the mother of all Deltas. But apparently originally it was more like a lake. And mm -hmm. one thing the Egyptians did, either Mizraim or one of the first pharaohs, if it wasn't in fact Mizraim, is they, they banked it in somehow. And so from henceforth, Egypt is the gift of the Nile. There wasn't a lot of rain, still isn't. Um, but once a year, the Nile would overflow its banks and the waters, as they swish down, would overflow and carry silt, bottom soil, and water to all the farmlands. And so it became important to harvest that water, channel it with canals and such, save it in reservoirs, because that's what you lived on. And... Uh, they did. And it was, in, in some places, it was a garden spot on the edge of what was quickly becoming the Sahara Desert. Uh, but this, this was something that was still not that far from Sumer, from Babel. And um, when you're teaching history, you start with, with Babel and Ur of the Chaldees, and you follow the, the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, up toward their headwaters, and then you take a hard left and bend down toward Canaan, and this is called the Fertile Crescent, because these were garden lands. They were well watered um, until the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and um, <laughs> they, they were places to be. And a lot of Ham's family's descendants, the Canaanites, particularly of various brands, stopped and settled in Canaan, but apparently Ham himself, because Egypt and scriptures called the land of Ham, moved on down with Mizraim into the place that would be called Mizraim, the Greeks called Egypt, and would create a, a rather advanced society. Um, and, and perhaps now's a time to say something about the pyramids. From ancient times, people have speculated as to what exactly is going on with these things. Nobody remembers how they were built although there are some increasingly intelligent explanations these days. I found one online and forgot to reference it, so maybe we can stick it in show notes or something. Uh, but we've heard everything from aliens to telepathy to anti-gravitation. Um, probably none of the above. It was <laughs> probably something a lot simpler because these these were people, their, their ancestor, I mean, Ham and his father and brothers had built a boat uh, mm -hmm. half the size of the Queen Mary. They had come out of an advanced technological civilization and they brought specific tricky concrete ways of building stuff like huge towers. Now the question is why pyramids? Well, Babel was a ziggurat. It was a, a step tower. The pyramids are a little more stylish, a little more cool, a little more geometric. Yes, they're lined up with stars <laughs> and longitudes and latitudes and all kinds of things. It's, it's a minimalist stepped tower. They didn't want the, <laughs> yes. the steps. No. Um, and uh, because here's the thing that evolution did to the historical sciences. Mankind had evolved from lower primates over a course of whatever the number is these days, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. Obviously, anything that came before us must have been primitive, ignorant, barbaric, savage. They couldn't possibly know all the cool stuff we know. And here are these pyramid things. And so a lot of there was a lot of simply ignoring the fact that we didn't know how to build them. Uh, and thus the door opening for all kinds of speculations around magic and aliens. But there was also more and more an assumption that it took a long, long time. That um, although tradition said that these were each tombs for pharaohs and that they had been built each within a pharaoh's lifetime, like how could that possibly be? It would take us forever because we don't even know how to do it. Maybe 
maybe they lied. But one thing we are, we are absolutely sure of, every, every pharaoh had exactly one pyramid, because that's all you need. And who would invest all the manpower to build two or three in his lifetime? <laughs> until we found out that someone had. <laughs> um, and uh, the particular pyramids, I don't remember their names, but if you look at them, one of them is um, kind of slanting at an awkward angle and and either did collapse or is on the, on, uh, about to collapse. The next one is goes halfway up at the same angle the first one did, and then suddenly everything bends in real fast, like, oh. oh we figured out there was a problem with that <laughs> there, angle. Let's yeah, fix it. Yeah, <laughs> there's a design flaw, but the thing is, they discovered in middle in the middle of building the second pyramid. So in mm -hmm. other words, the first one is barely off the line when they started on a second one and they were able to fix the design flaw. And the third one, they simply changed the angle altogether and the same pharaoh bears the names. In other words, first of all, it didn't take nearly as long as anybody did. So obviously, short of magic and, and aliens, there is a there's a fast mechanical way of getting these things up. Um, two. There's something wrong with the theory that they're primarily um, tombs for pharaohs because you, you're not going to bury your body in three places. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, what was really going on? Why did the Egyptians build these things and keep building them when the pharaoh already had one, two? Why build the third one? What's what were they really after? Another thing that feeds into this is that we used to assume that these these are huge public works programs. Obviously, this is what you have your slaves do. Until excavations around the Great Pyramid showed, um, actually, they were built by Egyptians in the off season when they weren't doing their farm work, and we have records of not only of the general names of of what's going on here, but each group picked a team name. It's like field day <laughs> at Cornerstone. They had. <laughs> They had their team name and their colors and their shirts or whatever. They were obviously in competition with one another. And it became a rah-rah, let's go Egypt. We all, it's, let's have some national spirit. Uh, Rachel, I think you had looked into this a little bit. Uh, yes. So it, um, it gives the opportunity for devotion to a work that is outside of their regular life. It's pulling them away from the bonds of their normal family life, their tribal life. They're instead coming to a particular place to work on behalf of the nation. Uh, so it, there's a sense of that early form of nationalism, but it's centered around a project for the Pharaoh. And if you're going to have that many different people working for you, doing these things, which their accuracy was incredible, mm. uh, where they're, you know, they're building these things that are a couple hundred meters across and their margin for error is in the millimeters, um, that they had built a system that was able to standardize what they were doing across many different groups, which means lots of bureaucracy mm. and a whole state system um, that is basically managing the workforce. And it's giving a new slant to the culture where it's not localized and everybody in their own little area doing things. It's it's bringing a centralization to the nation um, and a lot more focus on the Pharaoh as directly ruling over all the people rather than he's the guy far away that we know as a representative of the gods. No, he's he and his bureaucratic forces are um, managing probably lots and lots of the aspects of how they did all of all of these things. Um, and so it it shifts Egypt to being more of a statist and centralized society from what it would have been before. So it creates, which I would assume it creates what the Pharaoh wanted, um, a nation very much focused on him and giving all of the power to him. Um, in the 1940s in America, we saw something. We being none of us here because we weren't alive, but my parents were. I, I was waiting for the 1940s to come <laughs> up, actually, with all this talk of state work projects. Exactly. Yeah, insert. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. I can never remember what the, the acronym deal. actually works, stands for. Works oh, Progress yeah. Administration. Yes. Or it was fondly called We Piddle Along. 
<laughs> Just um, the only one I can remember. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> the it's easy much one. Much funnier. National Industrial Recovery Act. There's a whole when mm-hmm. when I there's a whole alphabet soup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when when I am introducing Franklin Delano Roosevelt to my students in econ or in in world history, I simply open the encyclopedia of uh, American history to the chapter that covers historically, chronologically, the New Deal, and I just start reading the titles of all of the acts, all the bureaucracies, all the departments, all the lawsuits, all the judicial decisions, and it goes on and on and on, and there is hardly anything that the New Deal did not try to encompass, regulate, limit, and put under the authority of the federal government. Another generation would not have tolerated this in America, but the Great Depression and now war uh, scared people good. And here comes this grandfatherly guy on the radio, new technological invention, Mm -hmm. with his little doggy at his side doing fireside chats. And playing grandfather to a nation. Wait, the dog gave fireside chats. Yeah, the dog gave fireside yeah. chats, exactly. <laughs> with with the hope of his his owner, uh, FDR. <laughs> uh, he, um, and that generation, poorly trained in economics and in God's law, became convinced that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had saved them. And if you taught when when I was a kid, if you talked to anyone who was around from that generation, unless it was my dad, um, and and tried to criticize FDR in any way, you would raise hell because they would tell you in no uncertain terms, you don't know what you're talking about, kid. He saved us. He saved us from the depression. He saved us from more. He short of God walking on earth, it's hard to come up with some with another phrase that that generation was willing to impute to him. Now, that was in a nation with a Christian heritage. Think of Egypt, where the heritage goes back to Ham, who was not exactly the most godly of Noah's three sons. Uh, And they were already piddling around. They come through Babel. They were already piddling around with polytheism. And so it became uh, a very practical way for the pharaohs um, Pharaoh is uh, a title. It means great house, but it became the name for the emperors, the kings of Egypt, the sons of the divine son. Um, this became the tool that they were able to use to create an incredible bureaucracy, such as the world did not see until the late 18 or early 1900s again. The kind, you mentioned the kind of precision. This had to be passed down in writing, in notes, uh, recorded, regulated, checked and rechecked. They had to get it just right. And you had to do this, as you said, with all kinds of people all over the place. Um, And by the time you were done, yeah, you'd go back to your farming. But you remembered you were a part of something really, literally really big. (laughs) You just built built a mountain to heaven. And the mythology of Babel still lingered. The significance of the, the mountain to heaven. I feel like there's so much we could talk about there. Are there a lot of natural mountains in that area? Like, obviously, we have Upper Egypt, so there's got to be some change of altitude. But (laughs) but once you come down, well, once you come down, I think where the Valley of Kings is, and you continue towards the Delta, it becomes progressively more flat, desert, Mm -hmm. nothing. Um, The mountains are the things that are far away in the distance. They're the horizon line. Mm -hmm. Um, They're the edge of the world. But yeah, that area doesn't have a lot of big mountains like we see here. Um, but if the mountains, if the top of the mountain is where you meet with God, you got to have a mountain, huh? You got to have a mountain nearby, you know. Uh, tied into this, and and something that in the 20th century, ni- the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, really picked up on, was the whole idea of life beyond death. Now, because of the Christianization of Europe and Americas in times past, when we hear life beyond death, we normally recast it in Christian terms. When we hear, for instance, that the pharaohs were embalmed and mummified and prepared for the afterlife, uh, we get the idea of, oh, so they preserved their body so they could rise again. No, <laughs> that's Actually, not what I was going on. I don't know that like, a lot of Christians would even think of that today. I think we've oh, really yeah. lost a sense of burial as a testimony mm-hmm. to the resurrection. Oh, I don't well, think most yes. people know the doctrine yeah. of the resurrection of the dead. 
because what is everybody's hope is to make sure everybody can go to heaven. Heaven, you know, yeah. Die and be with Jesus, which is the, the great hope for now, but mm -hmm. it's not the end of the story by a long shot. So uh, let me uh, let me do a dog leg here. I, I don't. I know you ladies have heard this from me, but it's been a while, and I don't know who out there knows the story. Uh, what became very key to the pyramids and the cult of the dead and the afterlife and all of this was the story, the myth of Isis and Osiris. Uh, the story goes that at the beginning of Egyptian history, which for them was some horrible time in the past, uh, there had arisen this great king named Osiris. He was a son, a grandson of Ra, I forget the exact genealogy, and Isis was his sister and his wife. And he brought peace to Egypt, he brought culture, he brought crops and farming, and most of our, all, he brought ale and beer. Mm, that's important. And it's important. That's it does society. not. Yeah, it does not get any better than that. And um, because of this, the Egyptians honored him as he was a god, and they encouraged him to go and spread the gospel of beer um, <laughs> throughout the, the the savage tribes all around them. And, and so he set off to do this, leaving his wife behind and his brother, the villain of the story, <laughs> called Set. Uh, and, and and Set was jealous. Think Lion King. Mm -hmm. um, and wanted wanted the throne and wanted the wife, but she was able to put him off and stall until Osiris returned. And so we have our villain saying curses foiled again, but he's not done yet. He needs now, he's had just enough taste of power and, and possibilities that he's going to make the definitive move. He's going to get rid of Osiris. Uh, so stealthily, he acquires Osiris's measurements, um, horizontal, vertical, depth, and has a, a chest, um, a coffer, it's usually called. We might think coffin. Uh, and um, it, it, it's just Osiris size. And he overlays it with gold and with jewels and gems and velvet lines and all that kind of thing. And he throws a great party and invites all the judges of Egypt, all the princes, and Osiris. And while everyone is drinking themselves drunk, he wheels this thing out and says, I just happened to find this thing lying around. And I'm in such a good mood, and I'm so generous that uh, I'm just going to give it away to whoever fits inside of it. Exactly. And so we play Goldilocks. <laughs> People line up to see if they fit, and one guy's too fat, and one guy's too skinny, and one guy's too tall, and one guy's too... Sh and they go through it all, and everyone's, oh, I didn't... Did you? No, I don't fit the thing. And then finally, Osiris comes, and it was just right. And they slam the lid on it, nail it shut, and throw it in the Nile. And Set takes over the kingdom and tries to make moves on Isis, who runs for her life and other things. Meanwhile, the Nile has carried this coffer in which Osiris has now suffocated to death, uh, carries it down through the Mediterranean to the Phoenician city of Byblos. And there it, get, it gets lodged against um, the bank and rocks of a cliff, and a tree grows up around it, uh, so that in the end, the coffer is in the heart of the tree. Isis goes looking for this weeping and wailing and hoping and wanting. Maybe there's something she can do. After all, she is a goddess. And she comes eventually to Byblos and and senses the disturbance in the forest or something and realizes, I got to get that tree. And so while she's thinking about what, what's my next move, she presents herself as a governess for the new royal infant. And with her impeccable credentials, she's accepted and she's given complete charge of the baby. And since she's in a good mood because things are going well now, she decides to give the baby immortality, divinity. And so every night she puts the baby in magical flames to burn off its mortality and grossness and turn it into a god. Well, you know, mom walks in, is horrified, snatches the baby and says, what are you doing? And then Isis manifests and says, I am a goddess. I would have made your child divine, but you forfeited that, ha, huh? now, never mind. 
uh, yes, goddess person, what can we do for you? Give me that tree. Okay, chop down the tree and give her the tree. So the tree is chopped down and lo and behold, there's the coffin. She gets it all the way back to Egypt and is ready to try to find some way to reanimate the body. But she stashes it in the cave and while she's out coming up with options to talk to the other gods, Set finds it. Says, okay, no more of this. Takes the body, cuts it in pieces and takes those pieces and throws them out into the Nile, into the Delta. Well, Isis comes back and says, oh no, not again. <laughs> so with uh, help from um, Thoth, the god of magic and writing, she sets out to... Interesting, by the way, that magic and writing go together. Oh, of course they do. <laughs> uh, um, she goes out within her little papyrus boat because, for future reference, crocodiles do not like papyrus. See footnote, see footnote to Moses' mom. Um, anyway, uh, and, and she finds one by one, and using this little lamp in the dark, she finds every piece of the body except one. <clears throat> Not being able to recover this crucial part of the body, she has one made out of wood or wax or something and inserts it in the proper location. And because of this, the Egyptians went on to worship this particular part of male anatomy for a long centuries after that. Anyway, while this is going, she flutters, she assumes the form of a bird and flutters over the dead body, because it's still really dead, and becomes pregnant somehow, and eventually <laughs> gives, a, gives a sort of virgin birth to uh, the child Horus, who becomes the new sun god and the avenger of Osiris. But meanwhile, with Thoth's help and Anubis's help, they bandage up the body and, and put all the pieces together with the one piece being supplied artificially. And through magic, Osiris comes to life, but not in this world. And this is the key for understanding Egyptian, the Egyptian cult of the dead, Egyptian mythology, and the Egyptian idea of the resurrection. What it means that Osiris, because his body is preserved here, his ka, or soul self, is able to survive on the other side in an alternate dimension in the other world, call it what you will, and there finally realizes his full potential for godhood. He becomes a god. And meanwhile, Horus sets about taking down Set, and that's another story of the virgin born child comes back and destroys the the bad guy and the, and the dying guy, the dying and rising God is part of this. But the resurrection, the rising, is not a returning of the, of the soul and the flesh. It's not a res resurrection of the flesh. They did not embalm the bodies, hoping the body would come back. They believe rather that as long as the body was preserved, the soul self would exist safely on the other side. And this is not at all different from what we've seen already from, from the ancestors of the Greeks, the Romans, and the Canaanites, who preserve the bodies of their ancestors, fed them, bring them water, drinks, surrounded them with pictures and things. It's the same idea. There is something divine in man, and death has the potential to bring it out. But what the Egyptians added, added was, but you need magic, and you need to preserve the body, and not just bury it so that you know where the bones are, but you need to preserve it as best you can. And you need to supply it with all the things mm -hmm. that we'll need in the, uh, in the afterlife. Originally, this meant that when the Pharaoh died, not only would he take, you know, his favorite couch and, and bed and lamp, he'd also take his favorite wives and his favorite slaves, and they'd just be thrown in and the things would be sealed because you never know what you might need. Later on, it became evidence somehow that symbols of these things would be good enough, much to the relief of many wives, concubines, and slaves. Um, but what we have seen in the excavations, particularly those around the Great Pyramid, is that although the Pharaoh could afford to do this in style, every Egyptian shared the same hope. Pharaoh was the leader. He set the pace. He crossed over, and in his death, he became an Osiris. He became a little god. And every Egyptian could do that if you could preserve the body 
and provide him with just at least the basics, including specifically the magic spells you needed. Because here's the rest of the story, but perhaps not for Osiris, but for those who came afterward. When you cross over, you run, you don't immediately stand at the throne of God, as Christians would insist. You're, you're more or less where you are, except in a different dimension. And it's scary and frightening and dark, and there are demons and monsters and things out there. And you need to get past these and go find the gods and stand before them for judgment. So you need magic spells. And so inside the, the tombs or the coffins, they would post, paste, um, all the magic spells in hieroglyphics necessary. So that in case you forgot, you had your cheat sheet. <laughs> and you could you could ward off the demons and make yourself make your way to the gods. And there you would stand before Osiris as the first of the gods to survive death. And the jackal-headed god Anubis would weigh your soul against the feather of truth. And if your soul was light enough, then you would be welcomed to the fellowship of the gods and pass on to the happy fields beyond, become a god and Osiris, blah, blah, blah. But if you were found unworthy, then you would be tossed into the mouth of the devourer of souls, a kind of hybrid hippopotamus crocodile thing, and you would be you would be um, digested in its bowels for centuries before finally meeting oblivion. <laughs> Ew. Ow. So among the the spells that were included in the coffins were spells to deceive the gods. Because nobody wanted to be swallowed by a crocodile. So when you stood before the gods, um, you wore a scarab upon your heart to quiet a heart that might give you away by beating too hard or too fast because <laughs> you're afraid. And the right words to say to charm the gods into believing that you were okay after all. And we have a list of, of some of the things that you were supposed to say. And they largely amount to not here's all the good things I did, but here's all the bad things I didn't do. <laughs> I didn't steal, I didn't oppress the widow, I didn't, you know, all those kind of things. And so even the gods themselves could be the victims of this magic. And so magic was the way of dealing with death, of dealing with even the gods themselves, and of ensuring that you became divine on the other side. And so the intense obsession with preserving bodies, uh, and if you had the money, if you were Pharaoh, you put an awful lot of money, you took an awful lot of stuff with you. We have no evidence that the pyramids were ever used for um, tombs. They may have been, but there are so many grave writers that they ever were, it's all gone. The Valley of the Kings survived better. Now, if you want, if you want a tomb, don't put it in the middle of the plane and say, hey, look, this is where I'm going to die and leave all my treasures. That's <laughs> dumb. Um, you the valley. hide it away. Yeah, you hide it away in a valley and put curses on it and don't tell anybody it's there. So as, as we come to um, God's people interacting with Egypt, this is all in the background. When Moses spoke to Pharaoh, someone could look out the window and see the Great Pyramid standing there. They could, they could talk to any of the wise men around and they would know these stories. They would know the whole polytheon of Egyptian gods. They were versed in matching. In fact, Moses, having grown up in the Egyptian court, um, children from noble families were enrolled in, in basically public schools at the age of four. And of the many things that princelings learn, huge on the list was magic. Because you had to know how to find lucky days. You had to know what amulets warded off particular diseases or illnesses, how to force people to do what you wanted them to do. There were, Moses mastered magic. He just didn't believe in it. He got his A's, as Daniel would later at Babylon University. He just rejected the whole thing. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he rejected Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. So... As we, as we stand back and look at the place that, that Egypt plays in the history of the world, uh, it, it, there's a lot that we can trace. We could talk about hieroglyphics. We could talk 
about the political history of Egypt. We should at some point, I don't know if we have any time left today, talk about Egyptian chronology. Probably next the, time. Yeah. Yeah. It's the it's the backbone of um of Western chronology. And if you get that wrong, you have a problem. You you lose a story. But as you say, we'll do that next time. And of course, the outpouring of the plagues, the exodus, um, the journey to Sinai, the giving of the law, all that takes place with Egypt immediately in the background. And Egypt's not gone because we keep running into it again and again, all the way to the end of the Old Testament, um, both in uh, political history, but also in prophecy. Mm -hmm. God has some fascinating things to say about, here's the house of bondage, and yet one day Egypt, he says, will be called my people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Well, next time we can look forward to chronology and political history of Egypt. Mm. But let's finish up tonight with some recommendations. I actually have one that's sort of inspired by this stuff, so I'll mm -hmm. go ahead and throw that out. Um, this is a sequel to a sequel of a spinoff of a movie. <laughs> that was a lot of extra things in the front of that. It is, so you would not expect what I'm talking about to be very good, would you? <laughs> no. But it is. I'm talking about Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. <laughs> um, it's a really excellent animated movie that came out couple of years ago, I think. Um, but the, the premise of the story is Puss in Boots is a cat, has nine lives, and he's lost track and suddenly finds himself on his last life and has to confront death and the, the reality of his own mortality. Mm. And it's a thrilling adventure story and the animation's very cool. Just highly recommend. Oddly enough, it's the only Puss in Boots movie I've seen because my dear daughter Haley insisted we see it. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen it, so I'll have to put it on the list. It's Very got funny. cats in it. You'll love it. Oh, yeah. I know. I've seen it. I love cats. Why have I not seen this cat movie? <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, do you have anything? Uh, so inspired by our discussion of geography, uh, I thought of a book that I read a little while ago called Prisoners of Geography, mm. which is the 10 maps that explain everything about the world. Uh, it's by Tim Marshall. I read it before teaching geography a year and a half ago. And it's a fascinating look about how the geographic features of every area have in many ways directed how the players in that area will act. Mm. And he wrote the book before um, the various Russian invasions of the last 10 years and basically predicted all of them in the mm. book based upon the geography of the region and what Russia needs. Um, but it goes through Africa and why Africa didn't develop based on geography. And just it's, it's really, really interesting and kind of unique in how it, it looks at the world and the events of, the, of history. Very cool. Yeah, so recommend. It's pretty easy to read. And also you actually learn geography then, <laughs> which most people need. <laughs> What's the name of it again? Prisoners of Geography. Cool. By Tim Marshall. Well, I'm going to recommend the book I require of my students in the beginning of world history. It's called God's Graves and Scholars by a man named, I believe it's pronounced Seram, C-E-R-A-M. He was not an archaeologist. He was a journalist. And for that reason can actually write a good story. <laughs> um, but he tells the story of the development, the creation, the birth of the science of archaeology. And there are healthy chapters about um, the deciphering of cuneiform, not of cuneiform, well, that too, but of hieroglyphics, um, the whole fascination with Egypt, how hieroglyphics began to unlock things. And then he goes on and talks about uh, Schliemann's discoveries in Troy and Laird's discoveries in Nineveh, and and it's very well written. It's a lot of fun. I've had, oddly enough, a, a couple of students who never really liked reading a whole lot come to me and say, this is great. Is there anything else like it? And I found out, no, really, there isn't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, kid. That was one book yeah, you'll ever enjoy. One, yeah, you really enjoyed this. I am glad. It's, so it's written as a series of biographies, <laughs> short biographies with a lot of action going on. And if you want an introduction to how we began, um, not through books, but through hands-on digging and dusting and looking, began to understand something of these, these ancient cultures. This is a good starting point. It is well written. It's a, it's a fun read. 
Um, and after you've done this, you can go to the British Museum and see a lot of this stuff and say, oh, that's what that looks like. <laughs> so, uh, God's Graves and Scholars. Very cool. Well, thank you both so much for this discussion. It's been a delight. I always learn a lot. So thank you very much. Thanks also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our financial supporters. We really appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, dear listener, you can visit our Patreon, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. And if you'd like to get in touch with us for any reason, questions, comments, okays, brickbats, our email address is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. We would absolutely love to hear from you. Uh, don't forget to tell a friend about us. I think the, the YouTube uh, ritual to say is like, subscribe, something. There's like, share, <laughs> and subscribe. That's the, that's the magic formula that YouTube teaches. Uh, so do share with a friend, however you choose to do so. Uh, thank you so much for listening. We will see you next time. 